Good morning, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to you this morning to our service, our online service this morning. Um, I don't know what week you've had. I don't know how many things are crowding your thoughts right now. But I just want to encourage you as we come together as God's people to worship Him this morning, that you would quieten your heart and your mind before the Lord as we just spend this next hour or so just worshiping our God in song and listening to His Word. Listen to these words from Psalm 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise Him. Friends, this morning as we come together, wherever we are, uh, scattered around Joburg, around the country, around the world, um, we sing praises to God because it is fitting to praise Him. Our God is worthy of our praise. Let's just uh, open up our time of, of praise now uh, with uh, prayer. Let's pray together. Father, what a joy it is to come together this morning uh, remotely to, to worship you together. Lord, thank you for the technology that makes this possible, Lord. And as we, as we come um, in our various places to, to worship you, we just pray that our worship would be acceptable in your sight. May it be a sweet and fragrant offering that goes up to you. And may you be pleased with everything that happens this morning. So we commit this time to you, Lord, and we praise you. You are worthy to be praised, and it is fitting for us to praise you today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him will live forever
is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved. God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world.
Stop working. 
Thank you, Lord, for being with us today. Thank you for meeting with us personally. Thank you that you meet with us even online in our homes. We pray for this service. We pray that it would be impactful to us, my God. We pray that you would reveal your mysteries and your word to us through Nick, my Lord. I pray for your hand of love over him, my God, and guide him as he leads us through these scriptures. I pray for understanding, my God. I pray for every part of this service may be a blessing unto us, my Lord. Thank you for the opportunity, God, just to serve you in this way, but also just to meet with our community online. We pray, Lord, that this is blessed, that it is good and pleasing to your name. We pray for our congregation in Jesus' name. We pray, Father, for each and every family. We pray that they would see and feel you close, that your presence will be present with them in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for we are not worthy even to, you know, address you, but you call us friend. And we thank you that you are our Father. All things and all glory to your name. Amen. Hello and welcome. My name is Janique Fanamerva and welcome to our service. I'm so excited that you logged on this morning. Um, I saw a meme, just quickly I saw a meme that said, just so that we are all aware and all together, I mean not in these many words, but the meme said that we are now on level two, stage four and wave three. And with that said, we are in the third wave. And because of this, we will be meeting online for the foreseeable future. We will keep you up to date. But we're just waiting for Corona to calm down just a little bit for safety and health for our community. So please, we encourage you to keep joining online. And with that said, um, we knew that this was coming. And so we need to be adaptable. We knew that meeting in person would not be guaranteed and this brings me to our couple of announcements that we would like you to note um, that's coming up in our church this week. Firstly it is about community groups once again and it is so important now more than ever because we cannot see each other um, but we can still meet online and like we have always known that God makes things possible and he is there where his saints are so please if you would like to start a group if you'd like to lead a group Group, join a group, fusion up a group. Um, please get in touch with Andrew, our deacon, or with Trish, um, and they will hook you up with everything that you need to know. With that said, Nick is starting his um, his group again. It will be on Wednesdays, but please note the time. Um, it will be from 7 to 8 promptly, um, online, Zoom only. And they will be going through the book of Jude. So it is an inductive um, group. So there is opportunity for more things to happen. They will be doing first second and third John later but for now they will be doing the the book of Jude so we are excited please join them please let, let Nick or Trish know if you would like to join and then just again we are online and we would love you to stay connected um, so please check out our social media pages um, our Instagram and our Facebook because this is where we will be releasing all information that you would need to know about the happenings in our church and then keep an eye on our website because that is live and anything and everything you need to know is posted on there so that you can keep up with our community. That is all for our notices. We are now in the part of our service where we pray for our family of the week. So join me as we pray for Chris and Julia Jacks. 
Dear Heavenly Father, this is your family and thank you that you have given them to us in our congregation that we can love and care for them. And so Lord, today we bring them before you. You say in your word that we are to be one as a body, like you and the Father is one. And so as the body, we bring Chris and Julia. Lord, we pray for provision in Jesus' name in all areas of their lives, my God. We pray for an incredible move, Lord. We thank you for your health and your hand over them and their extended family all over the world, um, over this incredibly hectic and stressful time. But thank you that you have been a good God, that you have been a present God and a faithful God. Lord, we pray now for the borders, Lord, that they are able to see each other as families, for they, for, for, as a family, for they long um, for each other, they miss each other. But we pray, God, in this time, even if they cannot, Lord, that they are satisfied in their hearts, knowing that you are taking care of all of them um, and that you are present with them and that you will make a way. Lord, we also just pray for Chris's business in Jesus' name. We know technology is taking a move and the internet is taking a move. So I pray, Lord, that you would help Chris keep up and stay on it, Lord, and prepare and, and, and open doors for him, Father, that no man can close, no man can open open. We pray, Father, that you would create opportunities just for him to flourish so he's able to continue doing work that you have given him, God. We thank you so much for Julia, Lord. Thank you so much for her perseverance. Thank you so much, Father, that she holds on to you. We just pray for healing over her in Jesus' name, that she would know, Father, that you are close to her, Father, that she can hold on to your word and your promises because you are true, unwavering, my Father, and always constant. Thank you that this is the truth of you, Lord Jesus, that we, that Julia and even us all as a congregation can stand on, can believe and can hold on to in these times that everything changed. Thank you, God, for the opportunity just to stand in the gap with them as they are salt and light. Father, we have, we pray your hand over them now until we see them again in Jesus name. Amen. Well, that is all from me. Thank you so much. Enjoy your service. Friends, let's come before the Lord now and give thanks for the offerings and the gifts. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning just with grateful hearts. Lord, we acknowledge again that everything that we have comes from you. You are a good, good God who provides everything that we need. And so, Lord, as a token of our gratitude, we bring you our gifts and our offerings, Lord. And, Lord, we just do so acknowledging that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Father, thank you for your provision in our lives. Thank you for your provision in the life and in the ministry of this church. And, Lord, we just pray that um, you would use these gifts that come in uh, every week, that come in every month, that you would use them for the extension of your kingdom. Lord, please give wisdom uh, for the wise administration of these finances and other gifts, that they may truly go where the need is greatest, and that they may be used in a way which brings glory and honor to your name, and that they may be used to extend your kingdom. So we praise you, Lord, and we thank you for these in Jesus' name. Amen. Behold the Father's heart, the mystery lashes on us, as deep cries out to deep, how desperately He wants us. The thing Unfailing Father Who compares to His great love Behold His Holy Son The Lion and the Lamb given to 
Hello again. My thanks to JJ and to Ingo and Brian and the team for stepping in and stepping up in my absence last Sunday. Trish and I were down uh, at Derbs, in Derbs by the sea, uh, where I had a good iron man with my iron woman at my side to support me and to mop my fevered brow. Uh, I was going to wear my, my iron man uh, medal for this sermon. But Trish wouldn't let me, sadly. Friends, unfortunately, with the third COVID wave in full swing, uh, we are back into a lockdown situation at church. We have had to pre-record this service. Now, hopefully, uh, we can go back to live streaming from the church building soon without anyone physically present, other than the team on the ground, of course. Uh, but please do keep an ear and an eye open for the all clear to come back to church in person. I hope it won't be too long uh, before we're able to do that. And just once again, please do be careful out there. Um, we are all, I think, really seriously uh, COVID fatigued and COVID did, 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 out. Um, and it's really very easy to throw caution to the wind. So let's keep those masks on. Let's limit our visits and interactions with others, and let's keep our physical distancing. You notice I said physical, not social distancing, because let's not socially distance. Let's make every effort, on the contrary, to remain socially connected as a church, whether it is via Zoom or WhatsApp or phone calls. You know, one of the negative effects of this virus has been the social fragmentation that it has caused. And we are actually created for community. So that has not been good. Anyway, we are back in the book of Galatians, looking at our Jesus Only series. Now, last time we ended in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, where Paul had gone to some lengths to establish his credentials and his bona fides as an apostle who, although he had never met Jesus in the flesh, had been given the gospel by the resurrected Jesus through direct revelation to him. You see, the gospel that Paul was preaching wasn't handed down to him by the recognized Jerusalem apostles. He hadn't uh, misheard or misunderstood what they had said to him. He hadn't accidentally or even intentionally dropped adherence to the Mosaic law, including circumcision, as a requirement for salvation. In fact, his gospel was, as I said, a direct and divine revelation. And the Jerusalem apostles had not only approved this gospel of Paul's, but had agreed with him that they would take the gospel to the Jews and he, Paul, would take it to the Gentiles. Now, you may recall from last time that Paul had confronted Peter and had taken him to task for being a hypocrite by previously being happy to have table fellowship with uncircumcised Gentile believers. But then, when a delegation of Jewish believers arrived from Jerusalem, he had withdrawn from the Gentiles and had separated himself from them. Okay, so that brings us to uh, chapter 2, verse 15, where we will pick up from this morning. Uh, Paul is still addressing Peter, or Cephas, as he is called there in Galatians. So let's read together from Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 to verse 21. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now, friends, this is an incredibly dense and complex passage, and it is Paul's first expression of the concept of justification by faith. Now, remember, this is Paul's defense to the Galatians as to his legitimacy as a genuine apostle and the veracity of his gospel, which does not insist on obedience to the Mosaic law. And Paul is using this confrontation with Peter as part of this defense. And he is using his rebuke of Peter as a teaching tool. And that's why he starts this part of his defense in verse 15 by acknowledging his and Peter's identity as Jews. This Jewish identity was very, very important. It is what set them, the Jews, apart as God's special and chosen and holy people. Because of God's covenant with the Jews and the Mosaic law, which they as Jews followed religiously and faithfully, they were automatically God's people, God's family, his children. And conversely, because the Gentiles were not Jews, did not have the law, did not follow the law, they were not part of the in-group. They were not considered to be part of the family. And that's why Paul refers to them there in verse 15 as sinful Gentiles. Now, that's not to say that the Jews didn't sin or weren't sinful, but the Jews had the law. And as long as they tried to keep the law and as long as they obeyed the prescriptions of the sacrificial system, they were automatically on the inside. The Gentiles, without the law and without access to the sacrificial system, were automatically always on the outside. But Paul says to Peter in verse 16, We know, you and I, Peter, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And, and he carries on there and he says to Peter, We too, you and I, Peter, we have our faith in Christ Jesus. And he repeats twice more the statement that justification is by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. And so Paul is saying to Peter, this is the gospel that you've been preaching, Peter, and it's the gospel I'm preaching. And the unspoken implication or the question in these words of Paul's is, Peter, given your and my shared belief that justification is through faith in Jesus and not the law, why then would you now separate yourself from the Gentiles and not eat with them as if they were still outsiders, as if the law did still operate and exclude them? And so what Paul is in effect communicating is that both Jew and Gentile, when they come to faith in Christ Jesus, lose their identity as Jew or Gentile and reconstruct a new, another identity. A person who was formerly a Jew and thus an insider and part of God's people is now no longer that. And a Gentile who was a sinner because he had no law and was an outsider is also no longer that. Now, both Jew and Gentile, former insider and former outsider, through faith in Christ, have a brand new identity rooted in Jesus Christ, as a result of which both are now part of God's family. Both are now inside, and no one is on the outside as a result of having been born the wrong ethnicity. There has been a change of identity. English theologian N.T. Wright relates the story of Margaret Thatcher, the former UK Prime Minister, who was visiting an old age home, going from room to room and meeting senior citizens who had lived there a long time. And one old lady showed no sign of recognition or realization that she was shaking hands with the Prime Minister. So Margaret Thatcher said to her, do you know who I am? 
No, dear, replied the old lady, but if I were you, I'd ask the matron. She usually knows. Friends, do you know who you are? Think about that for a moment. Who are you? If I ask that question to you face to face, you may say, well, my name is Lovemore Sibanda. Well, that is if your name is Lovemore and your surname is Sibanda. If not, you'd be lying. But is your name who you are? Does your identity lie in your name? The sciences, psychology, sociology, physiology, no, sorry, not physiology, philosophy and anthropology all go very deep into what identity is and what factors influence our identity. But in a nutshell, a person's identity relates to self-image, your mental uh, model of yourself, self-esteem and individuality. And many, many factors come into play in these three areas of self-image, self-esteem and individuality. Things such as our position and station in life, our status, our job, our relationships, gender, age, ethnicity, and so on. And so I may, for instance, identify myself as Nick Becker, a 53-year-old white South African Christian cisgender heterosexual male, a pastor, a husband of one wife, a brother of two half-sisters, and a father of three children. That would be a pretty concise description of who I am, my identity, in the eyes of the world. And to a large extent, the choices I make and the things I do are related to those factors. The problem for all of us is that the struggles or the troubles or the dysfunctionality in any of these areas could have a massive impact on us. It could severely impact our sense of worth or value, our sense of belonging, and it could impact our emotional and mental health and our well-being generally. But what has this got to do with our passage this morning? Well, everything. You see, the question that Paul and Peter have run into which was focused on whether Jewish and Gentile Christians were allowed to eat at the same table, is the question, who is God's true Israel? Who is God's true chosen people? Who are the true people of God? Is it all who belong to the Messiah, or is it only Jewish Christians, including Gentiles who have converted to, uh, to Judaism? And Paul focuses his answer on the most basic point of all, and that is that God's true Israel is actually one person. It is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Jesus and only Jesus is the faithful one. He is the true Israelite. He is the foundation or the basis of the identity of all God's people. If Jesus, the Messiah, is the true Israel, then it follows logically that only those who belong to the Messiah can, by extension, call themselves God's people. And so the question becomes, how is our identity in Christ, our identity as belonging to the Messiah, expressed? And Paul answers this with one of his most famous beliefs. And that is by being in Christ. You see, those who belong to the Messiah are in the Messiah. And so what is true of him is true of them. Now, this concept is a little bit difficult for us to grasp in our highly individualistic, modern, Western mentality. Um, but it's a bit like a king who represents his people. We don't have kings, but the Jews did, and they had no problem with this concept. It's like David, when he went to fight Goliath. David represented the whole of Israel, 
And so when he defeated Goliath, who represented the Philistines, the battle was over. It was finished. The armies didn't say, well, that was their fight. That was between David and Goliath. Let's carry on with our battle. No. The outcome of the battle hinged on the two representatives of the two armies. If the person representing the army won, the whole army won. Paul's point that is assumed here, and he will return to it in more detail later, is that all who are in the Messiah are the true people of God, irrespective of their race or ethnicity. And later on, Paul will include gender and, and status, slave and free. We'll come to that next week. Friends, that means that all Gentiles and all Jews who are in Christ are the true people of God, without any exception. It's all about Jesus and Jesus only. He is the only representative of the people of God, the one and only representative. And so when we are in Christ, our previous identity means nothing. The old self has died. It is dead and buried. It is gone. That is why Paul goes on in verse 19 and he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Paul sees a complete break with the past and a new life and a new identity in Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't something uh, that is unique in this, in this book here. This was, this was Paul's theology. In Romans 6, Paul says pretty much the same thing. He says that we have been baptized into Christ's death and we have been buried with him. He also says in Romans 6 that we have been united with Christ in his death and our old self was crucified with him. In a later letter, Paul says the same thing in a different way. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. When we turn to Jesus in faith and accept him as our Lord and Savior, then the old sinful person dies and we get new life in Jesus Christ. And friends, that is why it is referred to as being born again. We are reborn as new people, new creations when we turn to Jesus then our identity is in Christ. And because we are in Christ, everything that Christ is, we are. Everything that he represents becomes true of us. His sinlessness becomes our sinlessness. His holiness becomes our holiness. His perfect standing with God the Father becomes our perfect standing with God the Father. It is because we are in Christ. Christ. And these things would not be possible if we do not die to the old person and are reborn in Christ. And that's why rebirth in Christ is vital for our salvation. Now, obviously, Paul is talking about this from a spiritual perspective. We don't literally die and we don't literally get born again. You may recall Nicodemus, uh, the Pharisee who met with Jesus one night, struggled with this very question. And, and he said to Jesus, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Duh, no, obviously not. Jesus' re Jesus's reply to him is that no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are born of water and the Spirit. And water here is a reference to Jesus, the living water, and it is a reference to baptism. If you remember, baptism is the outward symbol of an inward reality. It, it symbolizes death to the old sinful self and resurrection of the new restored creation in Christ. And so this new identity we have in Christ, which we have in common with all God's people, is a spiritual reality. But it can, and indeed it should, have practical application and outworking in our lives too. Whilst our identity on this earth is determined by a bunch of factors, 
such as our age, nationality, race, gender, relationships, jobs. I mentioned those just now. These things can and do change. And those changes can impact us negatively. But overarching these factors should be, first and foremost, our identity in Christ. It is our identity in Christ which makes us part of his special and chosen people. And that should inform our behavior, our thoughts, our actions, our hopes and dreams and plans and aspirations. Not those other factors, age, nationality, ethnicity, gender, relationships, job, etc. We are first in Christ before we are white or black. We are first in Christ before we are male or female or transgender or pangender or non-binary, whatever the gender is. We are first in Christ before we are a child or a teenager or a young adult or a gogo or an old topi or a husband or a mother or a doctor or a plumber. In Christ is what is most important. In Christ is first and foremost what we are. In Christ is our identity. And it is our identity in Christ as his chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession called out of darkness into his marvelous light, which should shape our lives. It is from our identity in Christ and flowing from our relationship with him that we derive our value and our purpose and our worth, our belonging, our individuality, our uniqueness, our humanity, our character. All of these things flow out of us being in Christ, our identity in Christ. Yes, those other factors do play a role. My choices and decisions as a Christian husband and father will be different to the choices of a single Christian teenage woman. But our identity in Christ is what is most important and it must always come first. In this passage, <clears throat> Paul introduces a new word, a new concept, and that is the word justified. And this is such an important word for the concepts and the ideas uh, that Paul is trying to convey here, that he uses it four times in these six verses. It's three times in verse 16 and once in verse 17. Now the word justified has a regular English language meaning and it has a theological or biblical meaning. It has two meanings depending on the context. The regular English meaning is that there is a valid and legitimate reason for something. So if I've been let down or betrayed by someone, I can say that I am justified in not trusting them because I've been burned by them. Theologically, on the other hand, justified means declared or made righteous in the sight of God. And there is another important word that Paul uses in verse 21, righteous or righteousness. And these two words, justified or justification and righteous or righteousness are very closely related. John MacArthur uses the analogy of a courtroom. If someone is found guilty in the court, they are condemned. The guilty are condemned, particularly where the death sentence is still in use or when it was in use. We spoke of a guilty person being condemned to death. The opposite of saying that someone is condemned because they have been found guilty as charged is to say that they are justified. It is the opposite of condemned. Condemnation says you are guilty. Justification says you are not guilty. Condemnation says you are bad. Justification says you are good. Condemnation says you are evil. Justification says you are righteousness. And there is that other word, righteousness, again. To be righteous means to be in good standing with God, not guilty in his sight. Now, as I said earlier, this passage is Paul's first stab 
at explaining the concept of justification by faith through Christ. Given that justification means being declared not guilty, not condemned, we have to ask what it is that we are guilty of or condemned for apart from faith through Jesus Christ. And the answer is sin. We all, without exception, are guilty of and stand condemned for our sin. If it wasn't for our sin, there wouldn't be a need to be justified, and there would be no need to be declared righteous. Our friends, we live in a world, and we live in times, when the concept of sin is a very unpopular one indeed. To speak of sin and to infer that all people are sinners is just politically incorrect. And we are regularly blamed and called judgmental and blamed for being judgmental when we point out the reality and the existence of sin. And as a result, generally speaking, we are hesitant to let the world know that there is sin and that all people are sinners. But without that declaration and without the acknowledgement of personal sin, the gospel message is utterly meaningless. The forgiving, reconciling, justifying and redeeming work of Jesus on the cross means absolutely nothing if we cannot take the first step of admitting our sinfulness. We make a mistake when we try to identify sin as specific actions, acts or omissions committed by people. You see, sin is not so much things we do, but sin is a heart condition. It's like a disease. If you have a fever and a headache and body aches and shortness of breath, you have the COVID virus. It is a disease. Those other things, the fever, the headache, and the shortness of breath are not the disease. They are symptoms of the disease. Sin is a rejection of God and a turning away from Him and His decrees. It is a declaration of independence from God, the things of God and the ways of God. It is a heart condition, a heart turned away from God. And the specific actions that flow from that heart, lying and cheating and stealing and adultery and all the things we can name, those are merely symptoms of a heart that is not aligned with God, a heart that has been hardened towards God and a heart that is turned away from God. And so friends, for us to become the unworthy but grateful recipients of Christ's atoning sacrifice and to be justified and declared righteous, we have to first acknowledge our sin problem. And for many people, that is the first and the biggest hurdle and a stumbling block. It is also where we need to start when we share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Far too often, and I've been guilty of this myself, far too often we start by telling people about the good things of being a follower of Christ. We tell people that Jesus brings peace and joy and hope, that he is our friend in times of need, that he is always with us, that he is our anchor and our rock and our strength. And all these things are absolutely true, but that is not the gospel. That is not the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news, the gospel, is that Jesus died on the cross to remove our sin as far as the east is from the west. And thus, we no longer stand under God's judgment. We are no longer condemned and we are declared righteous, not guilty in the sight of God. And that only makes sense if there is an awareness, an acknowledgement, and a deep regret or contrition for our sin condition and the specific actions that flow from that sin condition. We need to present Jesus to the world as the one who saves us from our guilty verdict. Anything less, anything less is a watered down gospel and is actually not a gospel at all. Paul is teaching justification by faith. 
But what is meant by the word faith? It is far too common today to hear that the only requirement for salvation is to believe that Jesus saves. Technically, this is true, depending on what is meant by believe. You see, to just believe that Jesus saves is not enough to be saved. That is not faith. Even to believe that Jesus is the Messiah or the Son of God is not enough. It's still not faith. Mere intellectual assent is insufficient. Satan himself believes that Jesus saves. Satan believes and knows with all his heart that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God, which is precisely why he tried to thwart his plans. The legion of demons that Jesus drove out of the pigs uh, at Gadara, sorry, not out of the pigs, out of the, the Gadarene and into the pigs, that those demons believed with all their hearts that Jesus was the Son of God. That doesn't mean that they weren't demons anymore. Jesus is the Savior, but in order for him to become my Savior and your Savior, we have to surrender ourselves to him and trust in him in obedience. He has to be our Savior and our Lord. To bring ourselves under his Lordship means living under his rule and under his guidance. It means living in obedience to him. And friends, we're fooling ourselves if we think that we're okay if we live as the world lives, but believe that Jesus is the Savior and the Son of God. As if that belief in Jesus wipes out our disobedience to live as he calls us to. Those who have been justified live justly. Those who have been made holy in Christ live holy lives. Those who have experienced the love of God love others. Those who have received and experienced God's forgiveness forgive others. Those who have been called from the world no longer live in the world and they call others to be out with them. Those who have died to the flesh live by the Spirit. You see, friends, God's people are those who have been transformed by his grace. They are new creations in Christ. That doesn't mean that we get it right all the time and that we are perfect, but it does mean a life and a heart orientated towards God. It does mean a life of obedience because obedience is the clearest expression of faith. Faith without obedience and faith Without the good works Christ has prepared for us in advance to do is no faith at all. As James reminds us, it is dead. And so friends, as we go out into the week ahead, may we just be very, very conscious of our identity, this brand new identity in Christ. The old is gone the new is here. We are a new creation in Christ. And may the, the truth of that spiritual reality be lived out very practically and very visibly in our lives every single day. And may we live with such an acute awareness of sin that we do everything in our power to avoid it. And may we be quick to turn to Jesus in confession of those actions which flow from our sinful hearts. And may we truly turn to Jesus, not only as our Savior, but also as our Lord, Lord and Master of and over every aspect and every sphere of our lives. May our lives of humble obedience and total devotion to Jesus be the true expression of our faith, a faith which justifies us, a faith which declares us righteous in God's sight. Amen. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that we, we get a new identity when we turn to you in faith. Lord, thank you that we are a new creation in Christ. The old has gone and the new has come. 
And Lord, thank you that that new identity in Christ is which makes us part of God's family, God's holy, chosen, called people. Lord, thank you that this new identity in Christ is, is what drives us, is what motivates us, is what shapes our thoughts and our actions. And Lord, may that be true of us every single day. Help us to remember, Lord, who we are in you. And Lord, not to put too much store by the things of the world, our, our age or our job or our money or our relationships or our gender, whatever it may be, Lord, those things are secondary and may they remain secondary. May our primary focus, um, our primary source of our, our sense of worth and value and identity be our identity in Jesus Christ. And Lord, thank you that we are justified by faith alone. And Lord, help us to have that faith, that faith which isn't just a mere intellectual assent, but a faith which is one which is lived out in obedience to you. A faith which is lived out uh, as, we, as we seek to, to live out the life that you call us to. And a faith which is visible to those around us. A faith which is, uh, calls us to die to self and to live unto Christ and in Christ and through Christ and for Christ. Holy Spirit, thank you that you help us in these things. You direct us and, and you guide and you govern us. Lord, help us today afresh just to completely turn to you, to give you lordship over our lives. And as we do that, Lord, would you be glorified in and through us. May our lives reflect you to the world around us. And Lord, give us the boldness to speak to people, to show people the, the sin problem and to explain that, that you are the solution to that sin problem. Help us to be bold in doing that, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, that concludes our service for today. Thank you so much for joining us. I trust that you have been blessed as you have been part of our service this morning. My thanks to everyone who helped uh, make the service possible today, to Steve, Janique, and others who have been part of things. Thank you very much for your help. Folks, have yourselves a wonderful week. Um, remember to be careful of COVID and do keep an eye on the social media to see what is happening in the life of the church. All the best and God bless. Cheers.
grace to love. 